First Corinthians chapter 13. I'm going to start with verse 31 of chapter 12. Earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging symbol. And though I have prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether prophecy, they will fail, whether tongues, they will cease, whether knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am also known. Now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. The English language in any language actually is quite interesting. If, for those of you who may be bilingual or trilingual, um, first of all, you're probably not an American. You're probably not from the U.S. You're probably from some other country in the world. I used to travel to Germany all the time. Uh, There's a German joke that someone explained to me. What do you call someone who can speak two languages? Bilingual. What do you call someone who can speak three languages? Trilingual. What do you call someone who speaks one language? An American. (laughs) And that's true. All the years I was traveling to Germany, I probably know about 20 important words, like where's the Flughafen, (laughs) which is the airport, the flying house, literally. But the thing about, one of the things about language is that uh, as you get more and more comfortable with the language, you get to the place where you understand not just the meaning of a word, but the shades of meaning within words. And you learn about how sentences are constructed in order to boost up or to give the meaning to a word. Now, in the way I just said that, you thought, oh my gosh, this is eighth grade English class again. But you do this without even thinking. You've learned it in the way that you hear people talk, in the way that you talk and you communicate, and you use words in a certain way, and you you surround them with other words to make sure that not just the basic meaning, but the 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 sense, the very uh, more detailed and spirit of the word is communicated. It's hard to believe that it was actually 15 years ago uh, that. Uh, Krista and I and Jason uh, got to travel to uh, Israel, and we spent uh, nearly two weeks there, 
uh, I forget whether it was 10 days or a full two weeks, but we spent, we, we first um, spent our time in Jerusalem staying at the For Zion's Sake Ministries and uh, took a couple trips with them, went with the uh, Calvary Chapel Bible College. I taught a, a class there at the Bible College and then we went with them up to uh, Caesarea and along with the Bible College kids and uh, sat in the, uh, call, not the Colosseum, but the amphitheater uh, that looks out over the Mediterranean there. Uh, awesome, awesome time. And then we were up in the Galilee. Well, while we were in Jerusalem, uh, for Zion's sake is kind of south of the old city. And we would uh, work in the morning at for Zion's sake and help in their ministries in any way that we could. And then we kind of took the afternoons and evenings and we would go up to the old city or to some other place to kind of explore. And it was too far to walk. Uh, and the buses were kind of uh, I don't know, iffy, I'm not sure why we didn't take a bus, but so you took a cab everywhere. And in Jerusalem, uh, what you do, uh, perhaps this is true in all the cities in Israel, and certainly in other countries it's true as well, you never pay what is on the meter. In fact, you haggle with the cab driver before you get into the cab to negotiate a price for where you're going to go. And he never turns the meter on. Um, and I, I'm not comfortable with that. I'm not a negotiator, okay? I know nothing about the art of the deal, so to speak, right? I'm, I'm uh, one of those people in the world that God created to pay full retail. <laughs> That's me. Uh, plus, I don't speak Hebrew. But Jason uh, had been uh, beginning his studies in Hebrew, and so he became our negotiator. And, and he was a good negotiator. He was a haggler. And uh, there were a couple of times when the taxi cab driver just would not come down to his price, and he walked away. I mean, he's, you know, he, he's a wonderful and gentle young man, but uh, watch out for negotiations. <laughs> I can say that because he's not here, right? <laughs> But he'll hear this. No, he loved the guy. But um, it was interesting because we were all amazed. Like, when did, when did you start studying Hebrew? And he said, well, I just kind of do it on my own. And over the last few months, I think it was, or maybe a year ago. This is not like, you know, learning Spanish or something, which at least has some, you know, connection to English and some, you know, you can make some connection. You, you've got to read it the opposite way, you know? It doesn't go from left to right, it reads from right to left, and no, le it's amazing. And we were all, you know, just kind of puffing them up, and Jason, in his humble way, said, well, um, you don't understand the kind, of the kind of Hebrew I speak. Now, I'm gonna say something that only some of you will understand, and then I'll explain it. He explained it that he spoke Tonto Hebrew. Now, for those of you who were old enough to remember the series, The Lone Ranger, it was on TV in the 50s. And, you know, The Lone Ranger was the Lone Ranger with the mask and his faithful Indian companion, Tonto, who basically said nothing. His lines were, ugh, ugh, mm, yes, kimosabi. I learned that word. I don't know if they made up that word or what. But... He spoke very broken and just the basic stuff. So Jason said, if you could hear me haggling with this guy, I'm saying, center city, five shekel, yes, no, that's it, you know. <laughs> because he had not come to that place of understanding. It was enough to communicate that we got some good deals. I one time took care of getting the cab, and I chose to pay retail, and we found out how much more it was than what he was, Jason was haggling. He could communicate and converse and have some commerce there, but the shades of meaning and deeper were lost. Why am I telling you this? Because there's a word here in 1 Corinthians 13 that is a critical word to your relationship with God through Jesus Christ and with your relationship with others as following our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the word that here in the English is translated love. 
if you perhaps uh, have the old King James Version, uh, it's translated charity. I think most of the other translations, I didn't do a comparison before the message, most of the other modern translations use the word love. But it is only one of three separate Greek words that are used uh, in the New Testament and are translated into our English word love. And so in this case, the, uh, actually the, the King James writers were on the right track to use a separate word with a separate meaning to it than just love. Love in the English language uh, can mean a whole lot of things. I heard Pastor Chuck teach on this uh, particular uh, passage of Scripture, and he said, you know, I can use love in a variety of ways. It can be used to describe my most intimate and powerful and meaningful relationship on this earth besides the one that I have with my Lord, and that is with my wife, Kay. And I say, I love her. He said, then I can talk about hot fudge Sundays. And I can say, I love hot fudge Sundays. But the meaning of that word, though the same word, is different in those, or it better be, I think is what he actually said. Maybe he could see Kay in the congregation when he said that. But we know it. We can hear that and understand it because the context of the sentence we would not expect and we would think someone was mentally unstable if they had the same affection for a hot fudge Sunday that they have for their husband or wife. We know that because we've learned that and understand that, but the word itself is insufficient just as it is. And here, the, the New King James writers, of course, the translation was in the 1600s, so the use of the English language was much, much different in those days. Pick up a manuscript from that era written in English and try to understand it. Try to even read the, the words as written uh, because of the script has changed since then and you'll have a tough time. But they used the word charity, which today has taken on a different word, or a different meaning. When I say charity, you think of, oh, some good organization is doing good somewhere, and they want me to give to charity. And that does a minuscule amount get to the heart of what this word means in this context. The Greek word is agape. The three Greek words that are translated love in the New Testament are agape, eros, and phileo. And you know or have some connection with the other two words that help understand the context that they mean. Eros is the word from which uh, the English word erotic comes from. And so it is, it is a physical affection or a physical feeling. It is the physical part of having a, an affection for someone, not just fully in the way we use the English word erotic, which is meant in English more within the, se the sensual and sexual area, but in Greek, eros actually is also used in other places about uh, affectionate feelings for someone, you know, your brother, your sister, or somebody like that. So, it, but it's, it's more the, the physical end of things. Phileo is f the word from which we get things like uh, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Uh, philanthropist, showing great... Uh, uh, love in a sense for people by giving away things. We have all of these uh, libraries in uh, Pittsburgh because of the philanthropy of Andrew Carnegie. 
Agape was a Greek word that really wasn't used much. It did exist before the New Testament. Some uh, teachers will sometimes mistakenly say it was invented for the New Testament. In a sense, it was, because what happened is the New Testament writers took hold of this word that was hardly used at all within the Greek and gave it a new meaning so that it, it became the main word that was used in the Greek language for the love of God through Jesus Christ for us. For God so agape the world that he gave his only begotten son. Nothing can separate you from the agape of God. Not the physical feeling, not the, if you think of phileo as the emotional feeling, agape is the spiritual. It's one way to consider it, but it has a different sense of it as well. If you remember, getting back to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 are one big section here where Paul is addressing the Corinthians' questions and his concerns based on uh, things he had heard about the activity of spirituals, the spiritual things, the pneumatikos, in the church in Corinth. And in chapter 12, he got us to the place of understanding. We talked last week about thinking of the charismata, the spiritual gifts, as it's translated in English, as the points of grace, the place where God's grace is brought to bear in a certain person's life for the good of the community of believers. And they can be anything from this fantastic, like uh, prophecy, healing, these amazing things, to the seemingly ordinary, like helps and administration and hospitality. And he talked about the fact that the, the main thing is it's the body of Christ and understanding the body of Christ and God's direction of grace to these various points are for the common good, that that's what this is all about. And that was his main point. And he talks about the fact that, you know, in the body, many members, one body, every member has a different function, just like every part of your body has a different function, but all work together for the good of the body. And when one is ill, the whole body is ill and all of this stuff. And then he has brought it back to, so does everybody speak in tongues? Does everybody prophesy? Does everybody have gifts of healings? Rhetorical questions with the obvious answer, no, 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 of course not. And that's, and that's normal. And we need to understand that because there are some within the body of Christ at large in this world that believe that you must do all these things or it's evidence that you're not really saved. That's just not consistent with the revelation of Scripture. But Paul has come to this place of saying, okay, there's this variety, and making the, the, bringing it back from this picture back down to see, you as different members, you have different functions, and you, don't, you can't all do all of these things. But, he says, earnestly desire the best gifts. And he's going to talk in chapter 14 about one of the ways to assess, well, what are the best gifts when we consider all of these charismata? But then he says, but I'll show you an even better way. Now this would be radical and their ears would be peaked to hear that because evidently the church in Corinth was big on the gifts and on exercising prophecy and exercising tongues and faith and healings and all this stuff. They were, man, they were going for it. This was big stuff and great. And Paul just told you, but there's an even better way. And that's how he begins. And then these very familiar verses that the danger with familiar, beautiful verses of Scripture is they can become so familiar that we don't really listen to what they're saying. We think of the poetry and beauty of the language and so forth. And so he begins by saying, even though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I've become sounding brass or a clanging symbol. Now here he's, he's speaking about the gift of speaking in tongues, which we find in chapter 14, the church in Corinth was doing and doing incorrectly as Paul instructs them and corrects them. And we'll get into all that stuff next week. 
But he says something that's interesting here. There's, there's no building a doctrine on just four words from the scripture, but there is a sense in the scripture and within the practice of speaking in tongues within the church since the day of Pentecost that there are two, two different ways that speaking in tongues is exercised in the church. And one it was what happened on the day of Pentecost. What the disciples were doing when the rushing mighty wind came and the Spirit of God descended upon them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke with other tongues. And when they came out, all the people were going, what's going on? These guys, are they drinking? Or what's this wind sound? What, what is happening here? And Paul stands up, or Peter stands up and says, these guys aren't drunk. It's nine o'clock in the morning. That's not the way we live. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, that in the last days, and then he goes on and, and quotes from the prophet Joel, that uh, there will be prophecy and dreams and visions and a pouring out of God's Spirit on all men and women alike. But the testimony there was that all the people, all the pilgrims, the Jewish pilgrims from all over the empire that were in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost, one of the feasts on the Jewish calendar where all were expected, if at all possible, to come to Jerusalem to celebrate. And so they're coming from all over and their languages were different. They said, we hear them speaking the mighty works of God and praising God in our own language. They didn't need someone to interpret what these guys were saying. They heard it in their own language. And there was no, someone stood up and interpreted the tongues that they were speaking. No, God miraculously gave them the ability to speak in a language they did not know and praise God. And it was a witness to all those around, wait a minute. No, these guys can't be drunk because they're Galileans, which is kind of a byword for uneducated country folk. That's really, when they, when they say, aren't these men all Galileans? They would be uneducated. They would be from the sticks. How could they know the language of Parthians and Medes? And they name 13 different areas. How is it that they know this? And that's when Peter stood up and said, <laughs> They're not drunk. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. This is the great outpouring of God's spirit in the kingdom age. But Paul also, that would be the tongues of men in this passage. But Paul also says the tongues of angels. Okay, interesting. Well, there is the experience, the Greek word for it is glossolalia. Speaking in other tongues or diverse tongues. And when we get into chapter 14, I feel like this is all a teaser for next week of chapter 14. But when we get to chapter 14, we will find Paul talks about the fact of speaking in tongues and interpretation of tongues. And within the community of believers, if someone is standing up and speaking in tongues, they better, there better be somebody there who can interpret it or it's no good for anybody. And the whole thing of the gifts is it's given to one for the profit of all. So if someone stands up in the midst and someone, we have some people here, several people here who can speak more than one language and someone could stand up and tell us something in another language. And if we don't understand what's said, it's kind of sounded nice, right? And I think that's what Paul is referring to when he says the, the tongues of angels, that language of the Spirit that is given by the pouring out of the Spirit that must be interpreted for us to understand. He even goes on to say in chapter 14 that when he prays in tongues, his spirit is edified, but his understanding or his mind is not. And it's because he doesn't understand what he's saying. 
I'm going to leave that as the last teaser for next week because I'm sure for, those, for some of you, you're going, huh? But what's the point of verse 1? Paul is saying, look, you guys, in the church, there's all this glossolalia happening in your services. And you are so proud of it and you think it's so wonderful. But I'm telling you, You can have all of that going on in the tongues of men and of angels, but if it's without love, it's just noise. It's just Kibo back here on the drums just banging on the cymbal. Now, he does it very nicely and with the right touch and with everything else, but if he just stood back there or sat back there during worship and just went bang, 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 we'd all be like, what's wrong with Kibo today? And that's what Paul's saying. If you're doing this stuff and you're all hopped up about, man, I can speak in tongues. But you have not love and it's not coming from agape. It's just noise. He goes on. Though I have, and you'll notice, I skipped the words, the gift of, because those words are not in the original. And we're trying to get to that place of understanding that these these charismata are not gifts in the sense of something that's given by God to us to possess and use at our own command, but rather they are those points of grace where God pours out his grace in a very specific way for someone to supernaturally do something. And though I have prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Now here he's really getting to the, some of the other gifts that, are, that he mentioned, some of the other charismata that he mentioned earlier. The gift of the prophecy, the charismata of prophecy, the charismata of the word of knowledge. It's implied the word of wisdom as well, to have some information supernaturally that allows us to pour out God's grace into a situation. He says, you can have all that. You can have so much faith that you could remove mountains. Actually, that's not that much. You do know that, right? Jesus said, if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, be removed. And it'll be removed and cast into the sea, right? So, so it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much. It would be impressive to us, though, um, if I told you that this morning um, Mount Washington was going to go into the Mon. <laughs> now, you might say, well, we have had a lot of rain lately and mudslides. But you know what I mean. We would think, imagine you encounter someone who prophetically speaks to you about things to come or says, and it happens, that Mount Washington ends up in the, better yet, it ends up in the Allegheny. So it's got to hop over the point, right? You'd be impressed. You'd think, man, I'd like to meet that person. I'd like to be near them. But here he says, if it's not done out of love, that one is, has, is nothing. These are powerful words that Paul is saying here. And it was resounding with the Corinthians, I'm sure. Last one, number three. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Nothing. So huge philanthropy, giving everything away. St. Francis of Assisi kind of thing. You know the story of St. Francis, and he was very wealthy, and he, when he was converted, the story goes that he literally gave everything away and stripped the clothes off of his body and walked out of the city that he lived in to declare, I will take nothing of the world, and then sought a life of poverty and of giving. And, I mean, that's, that's amazing, right? He said, well, I could do that, or I could give my body to be burned. And, and the sense of that is not in some kind of weird way, but is rather that 
being willing to stand for something to the point of horrible death is the sense of this. I will, I will be burned alive for others. Many of our brothers and sisters of the faith in the second and third century gave their bodies to be burned instead of saying the words, Caesar is Lord, because they would not deny the fact that Jesus is Lord. And so, he says, it profits me nothing. Powerful. He's trying to give us the understanding, and certainly in the context to the Corinthians, how important agape is. And if I were in the Corinthian church, I would be saying, well, we place all of this importance on these things. These are the spiritual manifestations of God in our midst. If we don't have them, then how do we know God is in our midst? So these are so important. And you're saying we can have all of this, but love is the more excellent way. Love must be at the heart and center of these, or they're nothing. That's powerful. And whatever it is in your life that you say, this is the evidence of God in my life. This is the evidence of God's move in my spirit. This is the evidence and my knowledge of God in my life. This is the way I walk my walk of faith in my life. Because God has changed me, this is what I do. This is who I am now because of God. And I'm here to tell you, like Paul told the Corinthians, if you have not love, if love, agape, is not at the heart of every one of those things, all those things that you are doing are worth nothing, no matter how big they are. And that's heavy. That's how big and important love is. Jesus said that's the way people should be able to recognize that we are his followers. It's by the love that we have for one another. That that's the signature and the sign of a Christian. Not our bumper sticker. Not our t-shirt. Not how many times we attend service. Not how many wonderful things we do. So the natural question at that point is, okay, what is this agape thing? What is this thing that is so different from our other understandings of love that we had to grab hold of a different word in order to use it? And that's what he gets to in verse 4. In verse 4, he identifies love, and I want you to think about the fact that in all of these descriptions, or nearly all of them, of what love is, Paul does not describe feelings, sentiments. He describes activities and attitudes. That's what he describes. And, and that's important to know. When we think of love, when I think of my love for my wife, I think of the way for 39 years I have felt because I've been privileged to be married to that woman. I don't have the same feeling for hot fudge Sundays, but a grilled medium rare New York strip steak. I love that. Got a couple amens testify. But those are emotional and physical feelings. It's different. And so the first thing that Paul says is, love suffers long and is kind. Uh, other translations have said is patient, um, it, but the literal word in the Greek is to suffer long. And it's very important that we put the first two identifiers together. 
Love suffers long and is kind. It's possible to suffer long in a situation, or more importantly, with a person, but not be kind about it. To not express how wonderful we are to suffer for, with this person. What a great person we are to put up with this situation for so long. Boy, it's hard not to do that because that's at the heart of man's sinful nature, pride. I'm such a great person at being humble. You just won't believe it. Love suffers long and is kind. Those are actions and attitudes, not just feelings, not just emotions. Love does not envy. It does not look at someone else's blessing in their life and say, why not me, Lord? Well, first of all, you use Lord in the wrong context there. Because if your Lord wanted you to be blessed in that way, you would be. So if you're whining and complaining about how he has not blessed you, don't call him Lord yet. Call him God. Call him the Mighty One. Call him your Redeemer and your Savior. But in that sentence, you are not expressing your submission to his lordship. You are becoming his counselor. You are becoming his advisor. You evidently have much more wisdom than he does. Else he would have done what you wanted and what you are advising him that he should. Being surrendered to the Lordship of Christ requires much. Jesus said, if you're not willing to pick up your cross daily and follow me, and you're not worthy of me. I like the idea of following him. So did many in Galilee. He says nice things. There are good people around him. He does amazing things. He heals. He feeds. Awesome. But when Jesus started teaching some tough things, it says, so many left that he turned to the twelve and he said, are you going to leave too? Peter said, where else can we go? You have the words of life. There's a song we sing here sometimes called Rescue. That's the line in it. And I can't sing it. I start doing what I'm starting to do right now. And my throat ties up in a knot. Because whether or not I can, in every aspect of my life, or any, let me say it more correctly, in a specific area of my life on a given day, not submit to his lordship, I will not stop talking to him, and I will recognize that I am in rebellion. And I also recognize, but Lord, I don't have anywhere else to go. I'm not going anywhere else. You have the words of life, whether or not I can put them fully into place in this situation, in this moment in my life, you are still God. Lord, show me how to live with you as Lord. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. I don't think that needs a lot of explanation. I think parading ourselves around and being puffed up is something we learn uh, 
very early in life somehow, or it's just in our genetics. In our, it's part of one of the sin genes that we just uh, we just kick on right away, you know. And it's expressed wonderfully when we see our little ones at a very young age. They start, you know, I'm going to put on a show for you, you know, and they'll put on some kind of costume or whatever. They'll make up a song and. Boy, over Christmas, one of our granddaughters, Lowry, she's quite uh, expressive and imaginative and creative. And um, for Christmas, she got this, it's basically like a mini karaoke machine dance light ball thing with a microphone. Right? So that you get the lights all over the place with it and you pick the kid's song you want to sing. And I'm not sure whether on the screen it has the words or whatever, but boy, we sat through a number of concerts over the holidays. <laughs> now, she would not make it onto, you know, The Voice or America's Got Talent um, yet. I'm not saying that she couldn't. She is, she is pretty amazing. But she just jumps out there and does it. And she loves it. And you can see as she does it, she's enjoying it. And in her mind, she's nailing it. <laughs> right? The panel out there is going to give her tens across the board. Right? You can just see it in her. And, and we encourage that at this point. Because those young ones need to have that, that strength and that ability to step out and do those things. It's wonderful. If I brought in my karaoke machine and did the same and couldn't sing on tune or at the right beat, you wouldn't give me accolades unless you were giving me accolades long enough for the men in the white coats to arrive. <laughs> Take me. Yeah. But we can sometimes in our expressions of agape start puffing up start parading ourselves in our agape. Jesus, in giving us instructions on a practical level on how we should pray or give, says we should do it secretly. Our prayers should not be the grand, glorious prayers of someone on the street corner impressing the crowd but should be the hiding in the closet, in the secret place between us and our God. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't pray as a group or out loud or in front of someone or that, you know, when John led us in prayer before communion that somehow that was wrong. No, it's about doing something for someone else's benefit. It's one dear saint of the Lord who I have been in certain circles with at certain times where it's prayer uh, amongst a group, you know, and each one prays. And this particular person has expressed to me on a number of times that they just feel like they don't know how to pray and everyone else's prayers are so much more wonderful and powerful and expressive But I can tell you, in any group I'm in where that person prays, my heart is struck. And there is nothing in what they say that leads me to think, what an ineffective prayer. Oh boy, if they would just use the English language better or whatever. There's nothing like that there. 
I just hear the I just hear the voice of one crying out to the Lord in his very presence or praising him. See, it isn't about how we hear it with our sinful heart. It's about the heart that goes forward to God. Our prayers are meant to be heard by God. Too often, we construct our prayers to be heard by man, especially if we're praying with other people. Love does not behave rudely. That word there for rudely is kind of a funny word. In the, in the Old King James, the translation is unseemly. I'll refer back to what Pastor Chuck said, that, and then I'll leave it at that because I don't have anything more to add. He said uh, the translation he used was weird. Don't, love does not act weird. The story he told was of someone who he knew who uh, had a huge, very loud voice um, and uh, just believed that now that she was saved, uh, she had come out of the, the, or she had been saved in, in the Pentecostal holiness tradition, so she wore no makeup, absolutely none, you know, no adornments or jewelry and dressed very plainly. And uh, she, at the time, Pastor Chuck was working while pastoring and he would take a, a streetcar, he said. Uh, I don't know exactly where he was that had streetcars, but that's what he called it. He would take the streetcar to work. And it turned out that she was on the same streetcar on some days. And if she would see him on the streetcar, she would cry out across the, uh, no matter where, how far apart they were when she got on the Praise God, brother, good to see you! With all the people in this crowded streetcar. <laughs> and, and he said, everyone would turn around to see who she was talking to, including him. <laughs> I thought that was a very gracious way to say it, right? He said it got to the point with her behavior that if he noticed her at the stop and he was on the streetcar, he would get off when she got on and wait for the next one. I mean, it was because she was, she was just weird. She was just weird. I don't know if he was behaving correctly, but I think all of us can understand where he's coming from and have perhaps encountered similar individuals in our lives. When the scripture says we're called to be a peculiar people, it means individual. It doesn't mean weird. Okay? <laughs> we aren't called to be weird. We are called to be different than the world. Absolutely. And I would rather see a weird Christian than one that is conforming to the ways of this world and trying to follow the world's pattern in their Christian life. Absolutely. But it's not an either or. There's, there's something else in there. So, love does not behave weirdly. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. The old King James used to say, Easily provoked. That's not the right translation. It's provoked at all. Seriously? Seriously? Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Early in, in my uh, pastoring, I, I had to deal with a... Uh, particular group of people and a, in a particular uh, ministry that um, really the older that I've gotten, the more I have recognized that um, the signs of Christ-likeness in this particular ministry were not there. There were a lot of leaves but no fruit, so to speak, thinking of the story of Jesus cursing the tree on his way to Jerusalem. 
And I can remember sitting uh, and, and hearing firsthand and other times listening to messages on CDs or online where one of the leaders of this particular ministry was rejoicing in iniquity. They were rejoicing in the judgment or befalling of others. It's not right. We're not called to rejoice in the iniquity of others. We're not called to rejoice in the judgment that God brings on others. It should break our heart because it's breaking God's heart. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For the Son did not come into the world to condemn the world, to bring the judgment of condemnation on the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. And that's the same calling we are to have on our lives. Oh boy, we got to warn people. And we sometimes can see it coming before they or sometimes others will of God's correction or for those who are outside of the kingdom God's judgment but we should not rejoice in it but rejoices in the truth bears all things believes all things hopes all things endures all things this doesn't mean we're supposed to be mindless and not use our mind. This is, this is supposed to, it's not all things as in genuinely every single thing that ever happens, hope in that. No, no. But in all things in your life, in all things that you encounter, you want to live in agape? Well, bear with all things. Because nothing comes into your life unless it is father-filtered. believes all things in the face of the opposite we believe in him and in his word in the midst of all of those things we believe in the midst of all of those things hopes all things we need that hope from the Lord that's the only place we can get it but in the midst of of whatever it is that we are facing, to hope in Him in all things. And endures all things. That's getting back around to the beginning at, at verse 4, right? Suffers long. <laughs> Endure. Run this wet race with endurance, looking to Jesus, who will give us the ability. He says, love never fails. And in the, in the, in the sense of the word fail here is not in some, you know, what do you call those things? You, nice little sayings that you can put up on the wall. Looks like a doily kind of thing. It's a, what is that, a sampler? It's a, what is it? Sampler. Okay, finally got it. So it's not that love never fails. The sense of the word is never ends. It will never end. Agape will never end. And we can see that in the context of what Paul says there. Prophecy, they will fail or they will end. Tongues, they will end, cease. Knowledge, it will vanish away. We know in part and we prophesy in part. These things will pass away. The day will come when we don't need prophecy. The day will come when we don't need a pastor to try and exhort and to try and comfort and to try and encourage and to try and teach. When we are all face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ, we don't need that stuff anymore. We don't need it anymore. At the end, he says, now abide faith, hope, and love, these three. We won't need faith when we are face to face with the Lord. We won't need hope when we are face to face with the Lord. But agape, we'll get more than we've ever known. All the empty places where those things are no more will be filled up with agape. Agape as the capability to have and demonstrate agape in all the ages to come. 
Verse 9, uh, verse 10 is an interesting one. Uh, theologically, in the history of the church, that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away with. There are some who believe that the, uh, the pneumatikos, the spiritual uh, gifts identified at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 12, uh, were not for today, uh, but they have ceased. And um, there are many good Christians, many great Bible teachers, uh, probably the majority of those who are on Word FM uh, believe that because most of them are what are known as cessationists. They believe that those gifts were just for either the apostolic time or just until the canon of Scripture was fixed. One of those two things, and then it wasn't needed anymore. And this is one of those verses that they grab hold of, and they say that that which is perfect is the canon of Scripture. Once the Scripture canon was certified, was agreed, was perfectly in place, that the gifts ended. It's interesting. I heard someone recently teach this. I didn't, I didn't, I trust them, so I trust they're correct, but they're fallible. But what they said was it wasn't until the beginning of the 20th century that any commentator taught that. At the beginning of the 20th century, there was a huge Pentecostal outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And many of the Pentecostal movements or churches of today were born in those days. The Assemblies of God traces their lineage back to those days and the Azusa Street Revival going on in California and the, the Bible College down in Arkansas, Missionary Bible College, and all of these things. And there was, there was a great move at that time. And uh, some who were against these things, took this verse of Scripture and said, aha, well, that's, what about this? But it makes no sense in just the, the, the sense of the reading of this. Especially when it says, when that which is perfect or complete has come, that which was in part will be done away. Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am also known. Well, I don't, I don't, we don't see face to face now, do we? We don't know as we are known now. Makes no sense. But I simply go back to the day of Pentecost when Peter said, the gift of the Holy Spirit is for you and your children and their children and all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Okay, that, that's enough for me along with everything else. What he's saying is when the Lord comes again and we move into the next ages and the kingdom of God, then we don't need this stuff anymore. We don't need this stuff anymore. Even, even these, the, the prophecies and the teachings and the wonderful revelations and stuff, they're just a glimpse. He says, we, 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 where, where is it? But, 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 but we, we know in part uh, and we prophesy in part. And uh, verse 12, now we see in a mirror dimly. Interesting little her historical fact right here. There were not mirrors in the day that Paul spoke. There were not pieces of glass with uh, uh, dark paint on the back that creates a mirror with silver and you know how mirrors are made and so forth, right? Instead, they used highly polished metals, which of course they did not have the polishing capabilities that we have today with all the machinery. And so imagine using as your mirror in the morning a nice, you know, aluminum pan and getting yourself ready for church like that, right? You're looking in a mirror dimly. You're not seeing all of the very specific things. It wasn't until, uh, what did I hear? Something like the 13th or 14th or 15th centuries that the idea of using glass with silver backing painted on it as a mirror actually started. And that's the sense in which we are, we are here today. Our understanding today, the prophecy today, the outpouring of God today. We don't understand everything. We see it not exactly perfectly clear. That's why we need to be obedient. That's why we need to have more importance placed on being obedient to the Lord than figuring out the Lord. Because we'll never figure out the Lord. We'll always be looking in that aluminum pan. We'll see 
pretty good, even if we keep it buffed, but not that good. Hmm. I can't wait till we as children, because in that context, if you look at verse 11, he's saying we're like children. But the day is coming when we're going to really grow up. He uses the imagery of the fact that pastors, teachers, evangelists, uh, prophets, apostles were all given to the church as charismata in order that the church might be built up, that we all could be built up and grow up unto the Lord. Well, there's a day coming when there's going to be a fast growing up in the twinkling of an eye, the sound of the trumpet, voice of the archangel. Dead in Christ will rise first. We who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the air to be with the Lord forever. And on that day, we will stop being children. And we will realize how childlike we are right now. As mature as you might think you are, you realize how childlike we all really are. Now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Scripture teaches us that no greater love can be shown than a man lay down his life for his friends. And that's precisely what Jesus did. And that's precisely what the Scripture tells us is the demonstration of God's love. For God demonstrates his love in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that it was not out of obligation, but it was out of God's will to love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And we are called to receive that love and be instruments and conduits of that love. And it is God's grace, it's a point of grace, God's grace being poured out in us and through us that we can love, that we can approach this agape, and that we can be instruments and conduits of agape to others. That's what we're called to. That's what this Christian life is all about. When I was a hippie, uh, early in the hippie days, I think it was probably 66, 67, might have been a little bit later, um, the Beatles came out with that song, All You Need Is Love. You know that one? You know, and they, they'll go on forever. All you need is love. Ba, ba, da, da, da. You know. It's a good thing there's some old folks still left in this <laughs> congregation. The rest of you are just kind of going, oh, pastor. there's no evidence, I don't stand in judgment of any one of them, there's no evidence that they knew, they, there is evidence that they were all witness to as to what love really is and who Jesus Christ is. Um, I don't know if we will see them in heaven or not. I hope so. But ultimately, they were right. They were right, and that's what Paul is saying here. All you need is love. The rest of it, will work out. But the love that we need is agape. And that's not just a feeling. That's not just an added, just a, a, a feeling. Thinking of another song says more than a feeling, right? I don't know, what's happening to me? <laughs> I'm channeling music. <laughs> okay, humor me until they get here, okay? <laughs> it, is, it is all that we need, and it is what we need. We don't need all the other things. Jesus said it like this, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added. And not to correct Jesus speaking, but I would say it's just as true to say, seek first to love like your Father does, your Heavenly Father, 
And all these other things will fall into place. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your love. For you have poured out that love upon us in a way we could not have imagined, in a way that we do not deserve, that we not only did not, but that we cannot earn. So Lord, we stand in grace that you have poured out and provided through the cross and through the empty tomb. And we stand here in this grace as children, longing and yearning to grow up into you. So Lord, I pray that you would look down upon your children this morning and that you would help us to understand that like Paul said, it doesn't matter what we say. It doesn't matter what we, what we do to prove how great we are. What is important is your agape spread abroad within our hearts and shining forth through us to the world around us. Lord, help us to follow those two great commandments. That we love the Lord God Almighty with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that we love our neighbor as ourself. And Lord, you will set all the other things in place, in their rightful place. And now may the Lord God Almighty richly bless and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you grant you peace. May he lift up his countenance upon you, be gracious unto you each and every day of your life through Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and our Savior and our soon coming King. Amen and amen. God bless you all.